Hello everybody, welcome to episode 36 of Glass Onion on John Lennon. Rather than this being the intro to an interview, this is the podcast. It's starting right now. I think I'm going to call this one Addendum, MDC, John, Marlon and myself. Or it could be John, Marlon, myself and Identity. Although that sounds a bit like identity's name for person, so I might drop that one. <laughs> but basically, this is kind of something I planned. I, I did so many notes before I talked to Gordon Rochford of Those Conspiracy Guys in the last episode, episode 35, that um, I kind of had in my mind that I might do some kind of addendum where I would just get to go through my notes and, you know, a solo episode, see what going through the notes sparked off so I could kind of indulge myself a little bit perhaps. I don't know about you but when you get into a podcast and you start to like the person's voice and the person's speaking style you know, as the phrase goes I could listen to him for hours or her so um, I don't know how long this is going to go to be perfectly honest. For those listeners who like listening to my voice and what I say then perhaps this will be to your taste. Perhaps it's uh, something of an indulgence of mine I don't know, in the the world of uh, trade-offs, you know, which if you think about it, life is really a series of trade-offs, you know, in relationships, in business, etc., etc. So let's say my reward for all that editing and research and everything, because I'm not making any money from this, is to occasionally indulge myself. So let's call it that. But I think I'm fairly confident that uh, today I'm going to give you some information, some insights that if you like the podcast and you like my style etc that you will enjoy and get something from don't have to listen to all of it of course but you know i'm a big advocate of uh when you start listening to a podcast and you should try and stick with it you know but uh of course up to you so i'm just going to set the scene so it's sunday the 19th of april it's a sunny morning here kind of on the outskirts of london let's call it the english suburbs it's very nice and peaceful here obviously it's very peaceful at the moment but um it's kind of peaceful here anyway. As ever, I'm between jobs, assignments, rootless as ever, really. Although that's not entirely by choice. So yeah, the last couple of episodes, bonus episode five, which was actually recorded quite a bit after episode 35, but it went out first because it was quite topical, was my appearance on the Tomorrow Never Knows podcast with Bob Wilson and Warren Brown. And we talked about MDC. I'm going to call him Mark Chapman from now on. I started calling him MDC because I knew that some people don't want to hear his name. Totally understand people who don't really want to know anything about this guy. Absolutely fine. But um, I don't really understand this thing about if you're going to bring him into a conversation, then you're not going to say his name. I mean, fine. So we touched on that. And Bob Wilson from Tomorrow Never Knows is clearly interested in the, let's say, alternative things. So, of course, this phrase conspiracy theory has been bastardized, has been turned into this incredibly blanket phrase which if you think about it really means you're not taking at face value what you see and hear on the tv of course there are rabid conspiracy theories who will talk about you know no planes on 9-11 my mind is fairly wide open i have my own prejudices so we all grow up with prejudices and you're absolute fool if you don't think you have any prejudice in you if it turned out there were no planes in 9-11, I would be surprised, but not that surprised because uh, I've come to the conclusion that TV is basically bullshit. It's a bullshit representation of some facts of things that have happened. So they give you the bare facts and then um, give you all the rest, you know, give you this uh, kind of smokescreen, one perspective, the, the perspective that they want. Propaganda is not a billion dollar or billion pound industry for nothing. In the last show, I recommended Tom Secker of spyculture.com's appraisal of the COVID-19 situation and the media coverage of it. As I said at the time, I don't agree with everything he said. I don't think he or Gordov, those conspiracy guys, or myself expect anyone to take at face value what they say, because then you're just basically doing the same as the quote-unquote sheeple that we're criticizing, you know. I went down that road, you know, it was around 2008 that I discovered what I'm going to call from here alternative information. Some of which involved conspiracy, some of which just involved classified documents that are never highlighted on the news. And um, and I went very gung-ho on that. 
And I realize now that I was basically doing the same as the sheeple, but in reverse, if you know what I mean. So I took this alternative information and pretty much took that at face value. So as my good friend Julian Charles, The Mind Renewed, very good podcast, we've done loads of shows together. We did one called Changing the Discourse in 2014, and that was about how do you get everyday conversations to have more depth and to talk about alternative information. But then um, Julian had a great idea of doing a talk called Nuancing the Discourse, which we haven't done yet, but we may well do in the future, which is to take you know mainstream angle, conspiracy angle, heavily alternative angle, let's call it, and then find somewhere in the middle, because the truth is always in the middle. I would argue there's not too many extremes in life. You know, there are some, but um, the truth is boringly somewhere in the middle. But of course, the middle of two extremes is a huge space. So it's almost bound to exist somewhere there. Anyway, I am rambling. I'm going to explain the title of today's podcast. And today's podcast sorry, was is following on from the last two, which have been looking at the murder or assassination of John Lennon. Another thing I find weird is when people say John passed on December the 8th, 1980. Again, not having a go at anyone. Say what you want. Some people I have a lot of time for say this. You know, John passed. John was murdered. John was possibly assassinated. The definition of assassination, by the way, depending on which dictionary, it's basically the murder of uh, an important person or a political figure. And John Lennon was an important person, both in terms of music and, as you will see when I start reading these notes, culturally as well, very, very important. So he was assassinated. He was murdered. He didn't pass on in some peaceful way. He died in an incredibly violent way. Now, was his death more important than other people's deaths? That is arguable. You know, the, the whole celebrity thing is, I mean, in one way it's beyond my comprehension, but in another way I totally understand it because they've taken over from God's and the general public seem to have this need to have someone who appears to be more successful or better looking than them to look up to. You know, that plays into the whole advertising thing of um, you can be as beautiful as blah, 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 and then you see a picture of them with no makeup, and of course they're not so beautiful, you know? God, where was I going with this? Yeah, so one of the reasons that John Lennon is held in such high esteem is because he was very, very famous. That's one thing. Now, he did have a little bit of something extra, but in one sense he's death isn't more tragic than anyone else because he is just a person okay he may have brought pleasure to millions you know but there may be musicians in the world who've for one reason or another have never really been able to break out and do it for a living potentially they could be bringing pleasure to millions but john lennon got famous and was able to bring pleasure to millions you know but he was also had some dark sides that perhaps are darker than other people. That's kind of been my mantra, really, on this podcast, is that John Lennon was just a bit more of everything than the average person, let's say. Anyway, so, yeah. MDC is Mark David Chapman. John is John Lennon. Marlon is obviously Marlon Brando, who I keep mentioning on this podcast, and probably going to happen even more, because uh, recently I listened to the audiobook of somebody, the Reckless Life and Remarkable Career of Marlon Brando. And uh, I love audiobooks. I love reading print books as well. don't really like reading Kindles and things, but um, audiobooks are wonderful. Again, it's dependent on the voice. And there's this fella, I don't know his name. I might put a link to the audiobook, in fact. I mean, it's very long. It's a good 14, 15 hours, but I listened to it over about two weeks, and the guy had such a great voice, just this lovely kind of soft southern US accent. And Marlon's life... I mean, again, deeply flawed. Again, we, who knows what to believe, but seemed to be rather deeply flawed. But very like John Lennon, just more of the good and the bad and the ugly. <laughs> it was just a wonderful journey of two weeks, you know, walking in the park, going about my day or whatever, listening to this, and um, just made Marlon an even more compelling figure. So he's going to come up at some point in this talk. And then I've included myself... I'll be honest and say that this podcast, any podcaster will tell you this, it is a chance for you to get out things that you want to say. And of course, it's somewhat beyond the scope of um, just a, a podcast on one person, even John Lennon, whose life did become political and of large cultural significance. Again, because I'm not monetizing this, I don't have anybody telling me 
what to say. I don't have anybody advising me on editing. It's all me and, you know, I'm not earning from it. So I basically get to do what I want to do. I'm taking this opportunity to get things out, you know, about myself, but not just because I like talking about myself, but because I feel that I have developed insights after 10 to 15 years, the last 10 to 15 years, just being, for want of a better phrase, an orgy of learning, probably at the expense of other types of orgies, but that's another story. Sometimes when you get on a learning kick, other things get uh, somewhat sacrificed, let's say. But um, no, an orgy of learning, mostly through books, podcasts and documentaries, those three things. And I've been through many, many journeys, ladies and gentlemen, in those 10 years. But I've learned quite a lot. And I've also been able to test it out in everyday life. I'm fascinated by the way people interact. And um, just to tell you one uh, funny story. Uh, when I lived in Thailand, I used to go to this gym, which was in a hotel, and it had a sauna. And saunas are just so lovely on multiple levels. And there was a guy, I think it was Canadian, actually, he used to come in the sauna, and he just used to yak on and on. Just sometimes interesting, sometimes not, but... After a while, like when you realize that you know you're not getting any conversation back, if you just keep talking, that becomes almost like a sort of pathology in my opinion. <laughs> anyway, you just yak and yak and yak, and you completely ruin my sauna time. So when I learned about this conspiracy alternative information, whatever you want to call it, I said in like 2008, 2009 was sort of the height of my introduction to it. One of my friends said to me, oh, it's the quickest way to clear a room is to talk about all this stuff. Because people, for various reasons, either they find it boring, they find it annoying, they find it offensive, or they find it ridiculous if you offer them a different view of the world. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I wonder if that'll work on this sauna guy. So I was learning um, a lot about the banking system at that time, sort of pre the crash, but I was kind of learning about it at the same time. And a friend of mine sent me a link to a, a little animated documentary called Money is Debt, which I would highly recommend. That will really teach you a lot about money and how utterly ludicrous the banking system is and how banks are making lots and lots of money for doing close to fuck all. It used to be bits of paper, now it's just moving figures around the screen and, and destroying people's lives in the process. So I thought I'd try this out. So I started talking about the banking system and I started saying to this guy when I got a word in Edgebase, Oh, do you know that, um, you know, banking is this and da 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 And do you know that 9-11, do you know about Building 7, blah, blah, blah? And the guy made his excuses and left. And I thought, oh, this is golden. So I started doing it in lots of places where people would be annoying me and talking too much. And they just immediately, pretty much immediately, just fuck off and, you know, oh, I don't want to know, you know. They wouldn't even say anything. They'd just make their excuses and leave. And it was hilarious. And it taught me a lot about... Um, how people want to hide from any kind of truth that they don't want to hear. And um, apparently, according to a talk I saw, the brain actually has a way of literally filtering out things that it doesn't want to hear. So in fact, you don't even have to do the work yourself for filtering out. Your brain will do it for you. It's absolutely fascinating. So I'm including myself in this talk, and I wanted to give you some sort of biographical information about myself and a few insights, just for those who are interested, you know, I have some wonderful fans, you know, just to give three names, Stephanie Sadie, David Rainey, and Paul Killingly. And they're not the only three, but they're the three. And also Mick Ord, who will be on the show at some point. He's the ex-head of Radio Merseyside, in fact. And unfortunately, he messaged me just after I left Liverpool, so we never got to meet in Liverpool. But just to say to those four people and others, you know, thank you so much for your lovely messages. Stephanie has said, you know... Your podcast gets me through work. Brackets, don't tell my boss. Those kind of messages are so heartwarming, you know. If I was actually a celebrity, I think one of the biggest battles is against your ego. But when it's sort of small scale like me, I don't really feel like it's expanding my ego too much, unless it's happening without me realizing. But it's at the lovely level of just feeling like you're connecting with people. You know, if I then went on to become famous then suddenly you're talking about adulation and you realize that people are just doing it in a blind fashion. They're just worshipping you and they don't know why half the time. It's this weird, unconscious reaction, unconsidered reaction as well. So let, let's say I'm going to ed dedicate this episode to Stephanie, Paul, 
David and Mick. A couple of them have actually said, you know, can you tell us more about you? So um, here goes. <laughs> I was born in... I was born? <laughs> Don't worry, you're not going to get the whole life. No, it's just I was born in 75, so I'm 44 years old now. I did various jobs for a long time. I was in the accountancy field for a while. And in 2003, I decided to try teaching English as a foreign language. A much maligned profession because in certain countries, pretty much anyone will be employed as an English teacher. And it kind of makes a mockery sometimes of the profession. But I think it's a very noble profession, undervalued, underpaid, rather like nurses. I feel a kinship with nurses. My mum was a nurse. One of my sisters was a nurse. So we've had this discussion before. So I've been doing that for the last 17 years, face-to-face -face until last year. Now it's more or less all online. I lived in Laos very briefly, which is bordering Thailand. And I lived in Thailand, including six months on an island, which was wonderful because it was spontaneous. I was in a break between jobs. And it's one of those things you always dream of. You go to an island and a couple who had a restaurant used to serve this amazingly tasty fresh fish. They heard I was an English teacher and I also had a guitar with me. And they said, oh, oh, would you like, you know, free accommodation and free food every day if you play a bit of guitar with my son and teach my son and my daughter English? I mean, and he said, you, you only really need to talk to them. You don't have to, like, do, like, grammar lessons or anything. So that was one of those lovely spontaneous things. And I hired a scooter and I used to ride around this island. It was Koh Lanta. Got Lanta in Thai. That was very memorable. And then I lived in uh, Bologna in Italy, and then I lived in Madrid, Spain, until last year. Now, beyond that, I would consider myself a writer. I'm not a professional writer, but I know how to write, and I've, I had a blog for a number of years. I don't really do much with it. Obviously, the podcast has taken over a lot since last year, and really the blog, in the end, came down to think for yourself. I was involved with activists for quite a while, around 2009 to 2011, so a while ago. There was one incident is when the government doubled the tuition fees mr clegg nick clegg promised not to do that double the tuition fees and i knew a lot of the people who organized a totally peaceful protest but the press all they focused on was one person who smashed a shop window the pink floyd guitarist david gilmore's son climbing a statue when he was drunk and someone throwing an egg at charles and camilla's limousine and i realized i just said fuck it they're not interested in the truth and that was a a great awakening one of many many awakenings for me so that was it really in that respect and i thought well i can achieve the same writing a blog and communicating online with people so i started doing that i have a youtube channel called contrafib which is a mix of music and spoken word there's some conversations with activists that i recorded a few years ago so if you're interested in that kind of thing i might float your boat and in madrid I recorded my first album at the age of 40. I had loads of songs that went back even 15 years, I think. Even longer, some of them. In fact, one of them I wrote when I was 16. I finally recorded it properly, professionally, when I was 40. And then proceeded to make three studio albums and two live albums in the next four years. So music is another big part of my life. And I guess the other big one, other than the podcast, is psychology. You know, I studied psychology at college. I never thought about doing it professionally at all but i've kept up my interest i've read lots of books as i said the book and podcast and documentaries combination has worked very very well for me and i've learned a great deal and as we speak in five days from now dr kirk honda of the psychology in seattle podcast highly recommended he has like a series of the psychology of and it's sort of famous people but mostly interesting famous people we did one on marlon brando I don't think it's on iTunes anymore, but I'm sure you'd be able to find it on a website or something. And then he did one about John Lennon. And he and I are going to talk about John Lennon's psychology on Friday, five days from now. That won't be out for a while because, uh, as you know, I've been stockpiling episodes. So you're probably going to hear that around June, I'd imagine. Probably the beginning of June. Perhaps a bit earlier. Let's see. So, yeah, we're going to try and sort of combine my John Lennon expertise and his psychological expertise and see if we can come up with some sort of interesting diagnosis. Not sort of a hard diagnosis, but some ideas about... Really, one of the things I would definitely ask him about is whether he believes in John Lennon's own theory that a lot of people who become famous are the ones who are more desperate for attention due to parental deprivation. I thought that's a great theory. The Beatles anthology book, which came out to accompany the series in the 90s, 
I think they even started the very first page, I think, other than maybe the introduction, is John Lennon saying, you know, I'm famous because of my repression. Yeah, so that's kind of my interest, let's say. Actually, a couple of other things. I went to drama school briefly, and I also did some comedy. And really, the main thing I got out of that, out of doing Shakespeare, even in amateur productions, was how easy it is playing music. My nervousness at playing music almost disappeared when I started doing Shakespeare and a little bit of stand-up comedy. Even I just did like four stand-up gigs, and it was sort of newcomer's night, so the audience were very much ready to support you. They weren't going to start heckling you and make, making you feel bad. Now, internally, I'm going to say that this weird group of four people that are... That's not the four people, the four fans who I'm dedicating the show to. The four people, as in Mark Chapman, John Lennon, Marlon Brando, and myself. I would say what those four people have in common is, uh, let's say, a, a rather complicated inner life and uh, a history of not always full-blown depression, but definitely brushes with the dark side internally. Now, of course, depression has become rather trendy, particularly among creative people. It's a word that's thrown around. People say, oh, I'm depressed, meaning they're slightly sad. Another podcast that I've been listening to for a while, a sort of self-development one, has said that he doesn't believe in depression. He, he believes in depressive moods. I would argue that if those depressive moods supersede your non-depressive moods, then you probably do have a thing called depression. Stephen Fry did a very good show about bipolarity, which used to be known as manic depression. And I think the Plastic Ono Band album, John Lennon's 1970 album, perhaps proved that depression slash trauma can bring great art, but that's become a little bit of a cliche that you have to be in pain to create great art. I don't believe that, but that album, which has really gone to the top of the tree after having done the show with Dave Thurmeyer, John Lennon in 1970, and then we talked about the best songs with Jason Barnard. That was episode 34. That was, I think I said it at the time, along with the Revolution 9 episode, that was my favourite one. The 1970 output, 69 to 70, and I'd include Cold Turkey and Instant Karma in there, Give Peace a Chance. That, that really has emerged as sort of top of the tree in terms of John Lennon for sustained work. And then the 67, Holy Trinity, you might say, of Strawberry Fields, Forever, Day in the Life, and I'm the Walrus. I would say those three up there as well. And many others, of course. So episode 34, if you haven't listened to that already. So I'm going to start on these notes. So... Basically, I'm just going to read some stuff and see what it sparks off. So I'm reading notes I made on the documentary called The U.S. versus John Lennon. Basically, I had a very intense period of about three weeks of research before I did the talk with Gordon Rochford, which was the last episode, episode 35. I felt like there was so much that I really went for it, but it, I really got into some dark territory and I, it affected my sleep and it was all a bit weird, but um, in the end, uh, worth it. Suffered for my art and came out with a some good material, let's say. So I watched this documentary, The U.S. vs. John Lennon, and then I read two books about Mark Chapman, one called Who Killed John Lennon by Fenton Bresler, and one called Let Me Take You Down, subtitle Inside the Mind of Mark David Chapman, The Man Who Killed John Lennon. I think I may have said previously that I did take a bit of an issue with Jack Jones, the author of that second book, using a John Lennon lyric, obviously Let Me Take You Down from Strawberry Fields. I think, you know, obviously there was a connection between Chapman and Lennon in that they... I mean, they basically just shared one moment, 10 seconds of life, but it changed so much. It had such an enormous impact, just that one five-second act, basically. But I don't think you need to start using John Lennon's lyrics in a book about Mark David Chapman, so I'd take issue with him about that. But I actually thought the Jack Jones, that Let Me Take You Down book, was actually pretty good. The Fenton Bresler one wasn't bad either, but I'll get to that anyway. So the US versus John Lennon. It actually starts in 1971 with the John Sinclair Rally. 15,000 people, December the 10th, 1971. It was a 12-hour concert. John Sinclair was the 10-for-2 guy. You know, he got 10 years in jail for selling two joints to an undercover policewoman. He served two years in the end and then was released a day or two after this rally, which would have definitely spurred Don and Yoko and their friends on to believe that they were really making a difference. I always wonder whether that was set up some weird kind of reverse psychology where they gave them one success in order to, I don't know, crush him at a later date, but I don't have anything to base that on. That's just one of those hunches, a little bit of intuition. The US at that time 
had been dropping two and a half Hiroshimas a week since 1969, according to this documentary. The equivalent of two and a half of the atomic bomb that hit Hiroshima in 1945, or Hiroshima. There is a quote in that documentary. I don't remember who all these quotes come from, unfortunately, but I highly recommend the film anyway, so you can go back and see. When people are geniuses, you have to cut them some slack. John Lennon did refer to himself as a genius, either mad or a genius. And then another interview, perhaps the same interview, he said, if there's such a thing as a genius, I am one. If there isn't, I don't care. <laughs> there's a stat here, 40% of dead US soldiers were between 1968 and 1972. In April 1970, Nixon invaded Cambodia, illegal invasion of Cambodia. Briefly mentioned by Ken Burns in his exhaustive, I'm going to get angry in a minute, 15 hour Vietnam documentary of 2017, documentary series. Oh, Ken, isn't that lovely? That documentary series from about episode three was a fucking travesty. Started off well, gave the background of the French in Vietnam and then the US entry. I mean, that's all fairly uncontested biographical information in terms of the war but then it you know it just turned on the emotion just didn't mention the cia didn't mention the pentagon papers actually didn't mention the phoenix project google all those things if you're interested and the the end of the documentary series i mean what a fucking laugh this is america learned their lesson not to go into foreign territories where they don't understand the language or the terrain give me a fucking break man Anyway, so Ken Burns did briefly mention the illegal invasion of Cambodia. Well done, Ken. Very thorough. And well done, Sam fucking Harris as well. Public intellectual, online hero. Did an interview with Ken Burns and uh, Lynn Novak, I think her name is. Didn't challenge him on anything at all. Nothing. My anger might come out every now and again. Because, yeah. <laughs> May the 4th, 1970 was the Ken State incident. That I talked about with Dave Thurmeyer, John Lennon in 1970, part one. I will constantly be referring back to previous episodes because this year I decided to kick on with the podcast, start promoting it a bit more and getting your people to listen. Now it's up to you, of course, whether you decide to listen, but I will be referring back at different times. G. Gordon Liddy, who was one of the Nixon administration, lit his cigar with a protester's candle. <laughs> He's in this documentary just coming across as a complete right-wing wanker. Not that all right-wing people are wankers at all. In fact, I don't even believe in left and right particularly. I mean, they are identities. Liberal is an identity, conservative is an identity, but they're just so used to prey on the tribal instincts of people that uh, it's just a joke, really. The terms left and right, as some of you will undoubtedly know, go back to the French Revolution and the court of Louis the, I'm going to say the 16th, feel free to correct me. And basically those who supported the monarchy sat to the right, those who didn't sat to the left. But of course now left and right, liberal and conservative, are basically identities that have been designed, processed into these very, very intricate divisions. Processed a bit like our food, really. It's amazing when you start talking, and there's so many tangents I could go on, because one idea sparks another idea. When I start my general podcast, Life and Life Only, at some point this year, I'll probably do shows and all these things. But there's plenty of information already out there. But basically, it's preying on the tribal instincts of people. And, you know, we lived in tribes for a long, long time. We've been, quote-unquote, civilized for a very short time. So it's no mystery that we hang on to these tribal instincts. The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. Very good book. That will tell you a lot of what you need to know about why people do what they do and, and think how they think. And crucially, react how they react. That's why you get all this hysteria, all this triggering. I know triggering is a fairly modern expression, but it's been going on for centuries, millennia probably. As I said on the show with Gordon, when you have psychologists working with you, so in the propaganda industry basically, they know more about us than we do, unless you study these things. But who's got time to do that when there's crap to watch on TV? I refer you to Bill Hicks for everything. <laughs> Get yourself a Bill Hicks education. There's tons and tons of stuff on YouTube. That guy was a visionary. I loved him. People like identity. So the problem is that people will identify as left or right for various reasons. And then they will tailor their thoughts to what a left-wing person or a right-wing person or a liberal or conservative is supposed to do. 
So it works the wrong way, unfortunately. And because people don't, in the main, critically think, and I know this because I worked with activists for a couple of years, did lots of work with the general public. I'm not just making assumptions. Everything is a generalization, as I've said before, because it's the general public. It's millions of people. You know, I could go on a tangent about education then. You know, we weren't taught to critically think. We're taught to be good little citizens. The education system was designed for people to go from school directly to the factories. That's why we have bells. That's why you have to put your hand up and ask the teacher when you can go to the toilet. All those kind of things. But uh, I will contain myself, not go on too many tangents. But essentially, you know, things like global warming, you know, apparently conservatives don't believe in it, liberals do. Brexit, you know, left, right. And it's all a big stitch up, to be perfectly honest. And if people spent more time thinking for themselves and less time looking for leaders and gods and famous people to tell them what to think, this would be a very different world. Anyway, back to the US versus John Lennon. Remember that? I'm just literally reading these notes, so I don't remember who said all these things, but I say I recommend the film. So Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, set up the FBI as a political police force. When John and Yoko moved to America in 1971, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman literally met them off the plane. They're described as sweet guys but hard-boiled political activists. John and Yoko were, quote, instruments in the hands of two political masters. I think John Lennon was pretty much out of his depth. He was dealing with street people. I've said this about Muhammad Ali before as well. You know, Muhammad Ali had, quote-unquote, street people in his corner, hustlers. And neither John Lennon or Muhammad Ali grew up on the street, so they were both kind of out of their depth there. Bobby Seale, chairman of the Black Panther political party, was more dangerous and threatening. Bob Wilson and I, in bonus episode 5, talked about this amazing thing where John and Yoko took over the Mike Douglas show, like a massively daytime, mainstream, conservative show. Not necessarily conservative uh, politically, I don't know what Mike Douglas's affiliation, but conservative in the sense of conventional. And John and Yoko took it over and they had Reuben and Hoffman and Bobby Seale in the studio, and uh, Mike Douglas looked fairly bemused throughout. John Yoko made dangerous friends and financed them. John Lennon had intellectual force behind his arguments, so he was dangerous. John Sinclair, who I mentioned, obviously inspired the famous song, I think pretty good song, but Jason Barnard didn't like it and put it in his list of worst songs, episode 33. <laughs> John Sinclair, who was kept for two years in maximum security, declared a threat to society for selling two marijuana joints to an undercover female agent. At the John Sinclair rally, FBI agents were writing down the lyrics, and one of them even kind of wrote a review. <laughs> it's hilarious. Saying, oh, this song's more repetitive than normal. Reminds me of extras, you know, the Ricky Gervais series, where they go to a nightclub and the bouncer starts telling him why sitcom's crap. <laughs> Some of the lyrics in John Sinclair. If he was a soldier man shooting gooks in Vietnam, if he was a CIA selling dope and making hay, he'd be free, they'd let him be, breathing air like you and me. That's serious stuff for a mainstream pop album. Those kind of things, you know, Gordon Rochford in the last episode was, he said, absolutely certain or as certain as you can be that Mark David Chapman was a mind-controlled assassin. And I'm not as sure as Gordo is, but I'm certainly very open-minded about it. These kind of lyrics, you know, CIA selling dope, you know, that's dangerous shit to be saying on a pop record that millions are going to buy and or listen to. There's a good video, actually, of the late Michael Rupert, who some dismissed as sort of an outlandish conspiracy theorist, and he did end up committing suicide. You can decide whether that discredits, whether he's a, what they call an unreliable narrator. There's an amazing video of him talking about the CIA selling drugs. Very, very interesting. In 1971, 18-year-olds got the vote, the 26th Amendment. In the same year, Strom Thurmond, you should Google him, wrote a memo to John Mitchell regarding John Lennon and his activities. In 1972, John Lennon got a deportation notice under the door, which he found quite scary. I think this is a John Lennon quote. We're here to bring the boys home, but don't forget the machines. What a great quote. In 1972-3, John Lennon had 60 days to leave the country. Leon Wilde, who was his lawyer, continued extending and delaying this, and John Lennon managed to hang around, do a bit of partying in the last weekend. Joe Rubin and Abby Hoffman had announced that there was going to be, I don't know if it was a tour or a concert, I think it was going to be a tour, a kind of rock activism tour, 
which would culminate in a concert at the Republican National Convention. Now, John and Yoko, on their second appearance on The Dick Cavett Show in 1972, both those appearances with Dick Cavett are on YouTube. Highly recommend watching both of those. The second one's a lot more political. They actually say publicly, we're not planning to do this concert, and Bob Dylan is not involved. That was another rumour. Whether they were feeling the heat at that time and decided to bail for that reason, I'm not sure. Another John Lennon quote, the only thing I really wanted to do was play in a rock and roll band. I can't let them take that away from me. I think he did say that, but I don't know if you've noticed, listeners, but there are lots of fake John Lennon quotes because really Yoko's made a, an industry out of perpetuating the peacenik John Lennon over all the other John Lennons, you know. That's how she wants him to be remembered. But, you know, in fairness, the world started to remember him like that almost as soon as he was gone. But yeah, there's some amazing quotes like, uh, a teacher asked me at school what I wanted to be, and I said, I just want to be happy. It doesn't matter how many friends you have, it's whether you have the right friends. These kind of incredibly banal, spiritual sounding quotes. And just to be clear, you know, I love spirituality. I think that is the key to life, is to look at it in a spiritual way. In fact, when I was talking about my interests earlier, I forgot to say, you know, meditation and spirituality, very much so. But I think there's a huge difference between self-development, self-help. Self-help has managed to turn self-development into this kind of glossy, very, very facile version of self-development. So after Nixon's landslide victory in 1972, you may have heard the story that John Yoko went to a party as the results were coming in and John Lennon was very drunk and took a girl into the room next door and started fucking her. And one of the activists very generously turned the sound up on the TV so Yoko didn't need to hear it. So... Did John Lennon have a dark side? Certainly. But, you know, if you're in his position where you can get pretty much any girl you want, then perhaps you would take advantage of it. Anyway, after the landslide, the FBI closed their file, but the INS, that's the Immigration and Naturalization Service, kept on. John Lennon stopped activism after the election. I think the last thing he did was in 1973, but effectively that victory of Nixon pretty much stopped John Lennon. And then John Lennon moved on to his next incarnation, which in one of the books is uh, defined as defeated radical. And then, of course, he became a feminist slash house husband. And that was quite radical, certainly for the time. Now, Leon Wilde found some documents related to Nixon showing, quote, improper interference in an immigration case and prejudgment. J. Edgar Hoover sent a memo to Haldeman reporting on the plan to kick John Lennon out of the country. In 1976, John Lennon finally got his green card, which is actually blue, or was then, I don't know if it is now. And just the final quote on this documentary, Yoko Ono says something about they tried to kill John. Now, you, you'll see this a lot, actually, when people die, although the majority of people still don't believe in conspiracies, they will say they, they shot blah, 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 who? They shot Reagan, blah, blah, blah. So I think people do believe it a bit more. As Gordon Rochford well knows, conspiracy is a huge industry, but I still don't think people actually believe it most of the time. I think they just find it titillating to look at the information and listen to someone like David Icke. I mean, he's quite entertaining, but I don't think as many people believe what he says as perhaps he thinks. I could be wrong about that, of course. Anyway, let's get on to the Fenton Bresler book. Originally, it was called The Murder of John Lennon, the... Subsequent editions are called Who Killed John Lennon? So again, I'm just reading some random notes here. He starts off by saying, in May 1960, while the Beatles were a struggling band, about to go to Hamburg, and Mark David Chapman was a five-year-old boy living in Georgia, at the Fontainebleau Hotel in Miami, there was a meeting between Robert Mayhew, M-A-H-E-U, ex-FBI, and the gangsters Rosselli and Giancana about the CIA and the Mafia getting together, quote, political assassination units to get rid of Castro. Now, of course, that all came out with the Church Committee in uh, 75, I think it was. Senator Frank Church, quote, the CIA is a rogue elephant out of control. Seymour Hirsch, the legendary journalist, declared that the agency had conducted a massive illegal domestic intelligence operation against anti-war and dissident groups. The Church Committee finding that they'd used Christian missionaries. Now, Fenton Bresler's book is the more conspiratorial of the two, and uh, not using that 
at all as a pejorative. I'm just saying he's looking at that angle. The YMCA, the Young Men's Christian Association, was in 90 countries. Was it a cover for an international intelligence network? The reason the YMCA is significant is that it's synonymous with Mark David Chapman's life, but we'll get to that. The CIA has never had a non-Christian leader. Now, the idea of behavior modification started in 1950 with the CIA's projects Bluebird and Artichoke. Again, I would Google those. In April 1953 came the first of 149 MKUltra sub projects. Again, MKUltra is absolutely declassified and factual. I think the only argument is how long it actually lasted. It officially ended in the 1970s, but perhaps continued with something other than drugs as the trigger, with memory loss included. The JFK, MLK, RFK, so that's obviously Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, as well as John F. Kennedy, and John Lennon assassinations, saw no trials, no criminal trials, except to judge sanity or insanity. Of course, JFK's killer, Lee Harvey Oswald, was conveniently gunned down a couple of days later, after saying quite clearly, I'm a patsy. People will say, of course he's going to say that, but the fact that he actually used that word, and he said, I don't know what I'm here for, and he had a, a cut on his eye, because one of the policemen had, had whacked him, and then he got whacked properly, by Ruby. Mark David Chapman and Sihan Sihan looked very composed and calm and Gordon Rochford made the comparison in the last episode. The psychological stress evaluator showed Sihan repeating certain phrases verbally and rambling in his diary. Mark David Chapman could have been programmed through being young and vulnerable and in a paternal organisation. I'm going to refer to the YMCA as the Y from now on. It's a kind of a nickname and it will just save time. He was put in an alien environment, which was Lebanon. Yeah, he was just randomly sent to the Lebanon, but there was a civil war in progress. And he made a tape of the war, basically, an audio tape of explosions and things. So probably had a kind of, let's say, uh, unhealthy interest in that. He may have been given trigger phrases. For example, the phony must die, says the catcher in the rye, which was a phrase that he definitely used. This book is basically Mark David Chapman biography and then... CIA mind control activities and John Lennon's political activities and he kind of quite cleverly weaves them in with each other and sort of hops between those three subjects. Going back to John Lennon's political activities, January 1972 FBI memo, quote, all extremists should be considered dangerous. John Lennon was the most restless and outspoken Beatle, a unique fusion of innocence, viciousness and directness. That's a very good description. Oh, I think I'm going to talk about Marlon Brando later. He had those elements as well. And in my own small way, I probably have those elements as well. Give Peace a Chance, which came out in 1969, sold one million copies. And in November 1969, half a million people sang it at the Washington Monument on Vietnam Moratorium Day. And according to what Gordo said in the last episode, Nixon was actually crying as they were singing it. John Lennon did a famous interview called the Lennon Remembers interview that I discussed with Dave Fermeyer. One of the quotes, there are a lot of middle-class kids with long hair and trendy clothes, but the same bastards are in power, selling arms to South Africa and killing blacks in the street. March 1971, John Lennon gave an interview with Red Mole. Headline, the working-class hero turns red. This was featured in Ramparts. I mentioned this to Gordo last time. Ramparts is a magazine that in 1967 had exposed the CIA's secret funding of the National Student Association. Very, very important. The FBI file on John Lennon still has 200 pages redacted. This is when this book was written, which actually was, I think, the late 80s, so it may well have changed since then. John Wiener, who wrote a very good book, Come Together, John Lennon, in his time, he got more of the files, but some of them are still redacted and blacked out. In Britain, you have the Official Secrets Act, which allows the British government to keep things secret, basically. In America, you don't have that. But when there is... Oh, what a lovely quote. Identifiable damage to national security. It's one of those lovely phrases that the powers that be rely on. Just say national security and anything can be kept secret. No problem. April 1972, J. Edgar Hoover directs agents to, quote, initiate discreet efforts to locate subject, that's John, and remain aware of his activities and movements. In May, the subject matter in John Lennon's file is revolutionary activities. So as I'm going through these notes, you'll find 
I'm going to be referring back to some of the stuff that was also in the US versus John Lennon. You just have to accept this is going to be a rambling episode, okay? But I can guarantee you there's going to be lots of interesting information. Hopefully there already has been, as we're 54 minutes in. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> stick with me, please. April 1972, first full hearing of John Lennon versus the INS. Memo referred to John Lennon as heavy user of narcotics. H.R. Haldeman, who I talked about earlier, Nixon's closest aide, was now involved. John Lennon told Paul Krasner, who was an activist, if anything happens to us, it's not an accident. Now we get to Mark David Chapman. Again, I'm just going to read a few notes. His childhood was quite normal, apart from a habit of rocking back and forth, which continued into adulthood. And apparently he was on a park bench outside the Dakota, rocking back and forth on one of his visits to New York before the fateful visit. He was close to his mother who told him he was born to greatness and would encourage his creative imagination. She was witty, warm, fun-loving and free-spirited. Who does that sound like? Julia Lennon, perhaps? While his father was reticent, a workaholic, and very controlled and structured, unable to communicate. Chapman blamed his father for the rage and crippling of emotions that resulted in his terrible expression of this in 1980. And Mark had fantasised about killing his father. Okay. Chapman's father used to hit his mother... And the young Mark became almost like an advisor or counsellor to his mother. Very, very strange. His mother was, I guess, had a sort of infantile side to her, so was not a strong parental role model. And some interesting notes here. Like Julia Lennon, Diane was more, that's Chapman's mother, was more like a best friend. And like Marlon Brando, Mark David Chapman was forced to protect her from age 10 in a strange role reversal. That was what I was talking about. Brando's mother was a drunk and when she didn't come home, Brando as a child and one or both of his sisters used to go to all the local bars in Omaha to try and find her and then bring her home. Or they'd even have to go to the police station to pick her up. You know, terrible for a young child to have to do that. John Lennon, of course, uh, Mark Lewis, and we'll probably dispute this, was forced to choose between his parents. Mark Lewis said that didn't actually happen. He spoke to someone who I think was there. So going back to Mark Chapman... This need to be mature beyond his years may have made him a little narcissistic and feel a bit special. There's going to be quite a bit of uh, kind of coffee table psychology involved in this. Coffee table psychology or drugstore psychology, as they call it in America, is much derided. But some psychological concepts are quite simple. So anyway, Mark David Chapman was quite fascinated with death, seeing a dead cat and noting the release of death. He was made guardian of the local church, but at some stage developed a tenacious and relentless rage towards another boy, and would later write of pockets of inexplicable and violent impulses that he was powerless to control or diffuse. Now, uh, another thing that he shares with Marlon Brando and myself, a strange relationship with animals. I used to <laughs> occasionally bring home dead animals. Marlon used to do that, and I used to try and rescue animals, but I also... We had a dog when I was a kid, and I used to pick it up by its tail, which I feel terrible about now. It was horribly traumatised, and it's so sad to think of it. Poor Susie, she just used to sit there growling when she got older, and she had a couple of heart attacks as well, and it was just awful. I don't think I was responsible for all of that, but uh, I still feel guilty about it. But, you know, I was a kid. But it's this strange mixture of destruction and sort of viciousness and a very gentle side as well. And I definitely have that. And Marlon and Mark and John all had that. I'm sure there are people who are getting really pissed off that <laughs> I'm putting Mark and John in the same sentence, I know. But if you've come this far, then I think you're sufficiently open-minded that you can carry on. So Mark Chapman created The Little People, a whole cabinet and committee of tiny cardboard figures that he controlled and could also squash by the thousands at will. There's a lot of contention about how much of a Beatles fan he was. He bought Meet the Beatles, which is the American version of With the Beatles. He was a Beatles fan, but not necessarily a fanatic. Apparently the story of him carrying Beatles tapes when he killed John Lennon was invented, either by himself or a journalist. He worshipped Todd Rundgren, whose lyrics were very different from John Lennon's. Chapman smoked his first joint at 14 and soon got very heavily into LSD. That may or may not have been inspired by John Lennon's and others' acid use. I did quite a lot of LSD between the ages of 19 and 21. Whether it had any permanent effect, I honestly couldn't tell you, but certainly coloured my view of the world. I'm going to do a show, actually, about the Beatles book called Riding So High, The Beatles and Drugs. 
the wonderful Tom Hunyadi. I really like that guy. My friend Owen was on his show, which is called Two Legs, which is about Paul McCartney and uh, something about that guy's energy I really like. And I'm looking forward to having him on the show. And we're going to talk about drugs, the good and the bad, and how they influence John and the Beatles. Undoubtedly, they had a massive influence. Anyway, like John Lennon, Mark Chapman would change identities periodically through his life. And Mark the Freak, a garbage head, which means a person who would take any drug that you give them, was one that lasted for around two years. Again, Marlon Brando was very similar. He would get involved in things very enthusiastically and then drop them. I've done the same myself. There are lots and lots of similarities. It doesn't matter that Brando was a famous actor. John Lennon was a famous musician. Mark Chapman was, to many, many people, a despicable person who killed a celebrity. And I'm a podcaster from England. But it doesn't matter how you end up in life. There will be similarities. There will be similarities between Elon Musk and a bum on the street. The fact that you've got money and you've been successful in this particular society doesn't mean that you can't have similarities to people who weren't successful in this society. I'm not going to say that anymore, by the way. I'm just going to carry on with this. For a while, Chapman felt he belonged in that group. That's the kind of drug garbage head group. During one LSD trip, he had a sudden urge to kill his drug buddies with a knife. On another, he ended up in police custody amid wild hallucinations. He would plan adventures. Again, this is something I've done a lot. I used to plan in great detail these trips what I call my escape fantasy. I would do all these great plans and I realised after a while that it's actually fun to make plans and that you don't have to be deflated if they don't work out. Anyway, Chapman ran off to Miami to join the Psychedelic Circus, a trip he planned meticulously like his later Hawaii and New York quote-unquote assignments. Anyway, he returned home fairly soon after that. In late 1970, his next incarnation as a Christian started when a local Presbyterian church invited him to a religious retreat and he gradually transitioned from being a garbage head to basically i don't know jesus freak am i allowed to say that follower of jesus i only say jesus freak because he was a kind of person like john like marlon like myself who would be excessive in their enthusiasms about things so he would have i'm sure put everything into religion put everything into drugs and he put everything into religion he experienced a quote spiritual rebirth just looking at my notes, I think I've actually put the Fenton Bresler notes. This is the more conspiracy-minded book. And then the Jack Jones, the Let Me Take You Down book, which is straight biography. I think I've actually put the notes together, so it's not going to be one and then the other. Chapman turned on John Lennon, remembering the bigger-than-Jesus remarks from 1966, regarded Imagine as communist blasphemy, and began to sing Imagine John Lennon Was Dead. He was obsessed with Todd Rundgren. Mark, as usual, urged others to see what he saw in the music and feel the emotional release offered. I can very much identify with that. This thing about having enthusiasms and not really understanding why other people can't share it with you. Even when reality was good, it wasn't good enough, and he continued to search the world of fact and fiction for an identity he could accept. Again, John Lennon, Marlon Brando, myself, all on this search, somewhat confused sometimes between fact and fiction, on a search for an elusive thing that may or may not even exist. You know, I don't buy the John Lennon 1980 thing that all these issues were resolved and he became a family man, blah, blah, blah. Elliot Mintz is employed by Yoko Ono to peddle that, I'm going to say, partial fantasy. As I said right at the beginning, the truth is somewhere in the middle, so he probably was somewhat contented in some ways, but, you know, you can write off the Fred Seaman book or the Robert Rosen book and the Galbert Goldman book, of course, but, you know, I think there's... Something in all of those. Mark David Chapman had joined the local Y, remember that means YMCA, at 14, and the executive director, David Moore, became a father figure, marking Mark out as one destined for greatness. The kids called him Nemo, which he later found out meant nothing, and he was their Pied Piper, including singing and playing guitar, having an almost mystical affinity with the kids and telling great stories. I will link to the documentary that I mentioned to Gordo in the last episode, called The Man Who Shot John Lennon. It was made in the late 80s, so quite soon after the assassination. It's a very, very even-handed and interesting documentary. Chapman was a good fundraiser, would always go the extra mile. You see, is that extreme element. Sometimes it's put to a bad use, and sometimes it's put to good use. In winter 1972, he received his high school diploma six months early, spent a few months in Chicago as part of a comedy duo, then returned to Georgia to work for the Y in a variety of roles, eventually being made assistant director of the summer camp. Through the Y, he joined ICCP Abroad, a non-profit international camp counsellor program. 
Mark actually applied to go to Russia, which is interesting. Ended up in the Lebanon, which I talked about earlier. Fenton Bresler says that could well have been a good place for the CIA to blood him, and that's what Gordon Rochford thought as well. So there was this civil war, he made a tape of the mayhem and would play it to people. Again, a kind of fascination with destruction. He then went to work at a Y resettlement camp for Vietnamese refugees in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, providing physical and leisure activities for 5,000 refugees. He worked 16-hour days, and on one occasion, President Ford came to visit the camp and shook Chapman's hand. He was very, very well regarded. That's beyond doubt. People loved him. The kids loved him. He was amazingly good with the kids. This was around the time that John Lennon had his second son, Sean, and won his fight to stay in the US. Great quote. I think it was the Bob Harris interview. John said, it keeps the conservatives happy that they're doing something about me, i.e. trying to stop his activities by kicking him out of the country, and the liberals happy that they're not kicking me out. So <laughs> it was this kind of limbo state that he was in for a few years. Just before the refugee camp, Chapman had got engaged to Jessica Blankenship. She appears in this documentary. He'd recently lost his virginity at age 20 to another camp worker, and sex was a problem in general. Jessica was a good Christian girl, and as a youngster, Mark had had no sex education from his parents and had been shamed by his mother for masturbating. This is a huge problem with Catholicism, in my opinion. I've known some lovely Catholics in my time, but one of the big problems is the relationship between the Catholic Church and a Puritanism towards sex. I'm not actually talking about the Puritans, because they were Protestants, of course, but sexual guilt, let's say, and the idea that an incredibly natural thing is sinful. To quote Sterling Hayden in Dr. Strangelove, denying your essence. There was a, a story I heard about a famous serial killer. I think his name was Albert Fish. He was famous not only for, I think he used to kill young boys, but he would cut off their penis. And of course, the natural reaction to that is a horrible pervert. But then you find out that, in fact, he used to get caught masturbating by his mother. And probably, like Chapman, received no guidance in that area he was told something like if you continue doing that you're going to be shamed and sent to hell or something so he was actually cutting off these boys penises to save them from hell this is yet another one of my issues with mainstream media mainstream life this sort of gut reaction never look at the details of anything you know the alternative slash conspiracy movement say what you like about them but they certainly go into a lot of details gordon rochford shows are up to seven hours i think four hours five hours six hours seven hours it goes into a hell of a lot of detail so it's this idea that in a warped mind you actually think you're doing good but you're doing bad you know this idea that all murderers and even the most ones who are guilty of the most heinous crime the idea that they're kind of rubbing their hands going oh i'm going to kill you know the idea that mark chapman going oh i'm going to kill john lennon i'm so clever he was a hugely deluded abused person who did a heinous act Misguided sounds like too polite a word, but I think that's really what it comes down to. You know, like I said, he didn't come out of the womb a killer, and nobody's family was a killer, so it's something to do with the way he was brought up and the environment he was brought up in and his reaction to it. That's what causes it. Anyway, Chapman had violent sexual fantasies and classic shame issues around the act of sex. He enrolled at Presbyterian College with Jessica to get the necessary degree to become a full-time Y member, but quit after one term. He had a friend called Dana Reeves, who we'll hear more from later, who was a sheriff's deputy. He suggested Mark become a security guard. Mark went on a pistol training course and scored slightly higher than average. This was a lonely job that gave him too much time alone to think and have strange dialogues with himself. Again, there's a... In all the people involved in this episode John Lennon would isolate himself Marlon Brando would isolate himself I have isolated myself and taken it to extremes when I lived in London I moved to London once it was the winter and it was one of my two minor I'm going to say nervous breakdowns and I didn't talk to anyone for I think it was two weeks or well, I used to go to this corner shop and I would exchange a few words with there but I didn't talk to anybody in terms of friends or anything didn't have any contact with anyone for two weeks. And John Lennon, whichever story you believe of his life between 1975 and 1980, he certainly spent a lot of time on his own, isolated. Why that happens is not always easy to say. Sometimes you get 
exasperated by the fact that most people don't talk about anything interesting and just yak on and on about bullshit. And as soon as you try and bring up any kind of truths or uncomfortable truth, they're not interested like the guy in the sauna I talked about earlier. It's a good way to get rid of people, start telling the truth. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this sort of desperate need to avoid the truth at all costs. It can make someone who is seeking truth want to just get away and isolate themselves, you know. Right, January 1977, Chapman left Atlanta for Hawaii. He came to paradise to kill himself, a first-class death, quote-unquote, struggling against voices of self-loathing that called to him at random moments, a blackness that steamed and hissed at him from a pit that had opened inexplicably inside his brain. I think that's from the Jack Jones book, Let Me Take You Down. There's some great writing in that book. He'd seen a map of Hawaii and been drawn to the islands, which seemed to represent freedom. There's a lady called May Brussel, who you may or may not have heard of. May, spelled M-A-E, Brussel, B-R-U-S-S-E-L-L. She was a conspiracy researcher. There's tons of her stuff on YouTube. She did three or four shows of a couple of hours each, just after the John Lennon murder. Very interesting. She mentions mind control places around Hawaii, but it's just quite indistinct. But certainly there were seven major military and naval bases around there, including, of course, Pearl Harbor. Chapman embraced Waikiki Beach for a while, starting at a fancy hotel before moving to the Honolulu Y. He began to learn the lesson that many wanderers and expats had before him, namely that when the money begins to run out, the islands of paradise pose a torpid dilemma. Those who linger too much without money, purpose or friends find the attractions fleeting and illusory and finally must turn inward for escape. Now, I'm sure we've all been there, right? You go traveling, perhaps you've been backpacking, perhaps you've just gone away for a little holiday by yourself and you go to somewhere that's lovely and you suddenly find that all your problems have a seat on the plane next to you. Brando went to Tahiti, of course he discovered Tahiti after the Mutiny on the Bounty film, but he just found that all his problems and lots of problems as well with the way Tahiti was run just followed in there. It's very, very sad. There's also a self-sabotage element to all our four characters in today's story. <laughs> That's a terrible choice of words, but anyway. Towards the end of Marlon Brando's life, because he was struggling with weight and he knew that his eating was out of control, he would lock the fridge and give his maid the key and tell her, absolutely under no circumstances, let me have any food after 9pm. Then, of course, the other side, the self-sabotage would take over, or the addiction side, you might call it. And he would then start raging against his maid for not giving him the key. <laughs> and would threaten to fire her. And I think did fire her a couple of times and then took her back the next day. Very interesting self-sabotage. I think I might talk to Kirk Honda about that, actually. The psychotherapist who I'm interviewing on Friday the 24th. Chapman sometimes slept on the streets and sometimes in cheap rooms, took any temporary low-paying job he could and called the suicide hotline to talk for hours. After a failed suicide attempt, which he took as another sign from God, the fact that it failed, he stayed at Castle Memorial Hospital in Kailua, I think that's how it's pronounced, K-A-I-L-U-A, that's obviously in Hawaii, run by the Seventh-day Adventists and was diagnosed with severe depressive neurosis, feeling at that time, quote, like a boxer in the 27th round. He was lifted by the kind attention he received and despite continued sexual fantasies and another fantasy about prison where he would be left alone to read, as ultimately happened. That's pretty much all he does nowadays is read books and I think he's allowed to listen to the radio. He spends 23 out of every 24 hours in complete isolation. There's probably some Beatles fans at this point rubbing their hands and going, ah, I'm so glad, as if that's going to bring John Lennon back. Although those kind of Beatles fans are undoubtedly not listening to this. So there you go. He made a remarkable recovery and stopped treatment after two weeks, deciding to settle in Kailua. He volunteered at Castle, this is the hospital, and was then taken on, working there for two years, first in housekeeping and maintenance, and then in the printing department and customer relations. He was outgoing and an excellent worker, displaying a strange ability to get through to others in need, including a woman who hadn't spoken in years. He bonded with a counsellor there, 20 years his senior, called Judy Harvey. Her diary recalls a man open and considerate, but little oversensitive. Again, that's something I've suffered from all my life. After perceiving that the local pastor who took Mark in had made him feel guilty about his friendship with Judy, that's a counsellor, he started avoiding her and calling her crazy as a nickname. He had a habit of mirroring other personalities to compensate for feeling he lacked one himself. 
He felt unique and important as the only mental patient turned staff member at Castle. At his best, his charisma and enthusiasms were infectious, and his situational depression, that's an interesting term, kind of going back to what I said earlier about a lot of people who say they've got depression are literally having depressive moods or depressing episodes. And situational depression obviously means that being in a certain situation makes you feel depressed. But when you're out of that situation, the depression is lifted. December 1977, his parents divorced and Diane, his mother, came to live in Hawaii. In April 1978, he suddenly decided on a world trip, particularly focused on Southeast Asia. With money he'd saved, plus the thousand dollars his father had given him, and the money he found was available to loan from the hospital's credit union, he took six weeks' leave of absence and took off. Now, two things there. The idea of flight, as I said earlier, of taking a bag and taking off by yourself. The other thing, where did he get the money? Fenton Bresler would say, you know, perhaps the CIA was supplying him with that. Inspired by fiction and travel books, he moved fast on his latest whim, and his enthusiasm helped him woo his travel agent, Gloria Abe, an older lady of Japanese descent, interesting, who, unlike Yoko Ono, was timid, naive, and trusting. But the idea of the older Japanese lady, of mirroring, I think I said on a previous podcast that I had a, a girlfriend when I was twenty, twenty-one, and we used to smoke lots of weed in my room, and we used to lie on my bed, and I would play the guitar, and she would kind of sit there, looking uh, quite enigmatic, like Yoko Ono in some of the videos, like the Imagine video, and then with John at the piano. Yoko comes and sits down next to him with a sort of faraway look in her eyes. I mean, that's no big surprise, you know, emulating your idols and things. But um, anyway, Chapman's July to September trip took in 12 cities and 11 countries, and he stayed in many Y hostels along the way at budget prices, his collateral being his membership of the association and a recommendation letter from David Moore. That was one of the directors, the one who really held him in high regard. Were there CIA contacts along the way, or was the trip a reward? So, yeah, did the CIA finance this as a reward for other work Chapman had done, perhaps? His spirits ebbed and flowed as he travelled through Japan, Korea and Hong Kong, then China, which was sort of newly open to the West, Thailand and India, where the gulf slash chasm between rich and poor affected him profoundly and the rich phonies angered him. Of the 1,200 colour slides he took during the whole trip, the most compelling were those of beggars in India. He briefly went to Iran and Israel, visited Moore, that's a director, in Switzerland, then went to England and back to the States, first Georgia and then back to Hawaii. He married the travel agent Gloria Rabe, that's the older Japanese lady, but saddled with a clingy mother and a new wife, tensions started to build. His mother started dating young local men and was very self-absorbed, so this mother sounds like perhaps a friendly lady, but far too emotionally immature to be a good parent. His promotion to the printing department at Castle gave him more money but was stressful and lonely and he hated the ever-present smell of chemicals. He started to teeter and put on weight, gorging on comfort food. Again, Brando, all over. John Lennon, health food, comfort food. Myself, extreme dieting. I went on a raw diet in 2010. I've been on all kinds of diets and then that's very often followed by gorging on uh, ice cream, you know, when uh, myself and Dave Thurmeyer, episodes 31 and 32, I think, John Lennon in 1970, we talked about if the Beatles were food, you know, George would be an Indian curry, Paul would be nut cutlets or whatever, and I concluded John would be brown rice salad washed down with five chocolate brownies and (laughs) three milkshakes. Anyway. Mark was short-tempered and upset Gloria's boss, forcing her to quit her job. The ever-continuing pattern was set. He was mostly well-liked but prone to outbursts and hostility. He was allowed to resign after a confrontation with a nurse at work and in late 1979 went back to being a security guard. He severed contacts with his roots at the hospital, started drinking a lot, resurrected the little people and developed a sudden penchant for art. This thing about severing contact with your roots, I've done that many times myself. And there's the idea of making a clean break, always looking for this fresh start. He put himself into debt by borrowing thousands from Gloria's father and then dropped the hobby. I think he managed to sell back one of the paintings and more or less broke even, but anyway. He managed to sort out his debts before quitting work and becoming a house husband, just like John Lennon. August 1980, this is where, in the book, as we get to the last few months of 1980, we have... um, Mark's activities and John Lennon's activities, and also the political activities running in tandem. 
John Lennon's making the Bermuda demos. Mark Chapman rediscovers the catcher in the rye and declares himself a 25-year-old catcher. Ronald Reagan is leading the polls. Now, there's been a lot of talk. Fred Seaman likes to say that John Lennon became a Reagan supporter, which, of course, would go against the idea of political assassination. Others totally disagree and say that John Lennon was still more of a left-wing radical. The catcher in the rye replaced religion and all the other sacred cows in Mark's life. But was it a trigger book, says Fenton Bresler. His attitude to violence was ambivalent, and he was by temperament a self-doubting Hamlet. After finding the Anthony Fawcett, John Lennon one day at a time book in the library and being angered, his rage started to build. He cut himself off from everyone, only finding peace in the library where things were quiet and ordered. Libraries are wonderful places for lonely people because they're nice and quiet and you've got all kinds of material there so you don't have to be bored. You'll find lots of lonely people in libraries, believe me. He went to a courtroom and watched part of a rape trial, no doubt fascinated by proceedings. I had an interest in criminology in the early 2000s and needed a course. I went to the public gallery in London, the Old Bailey. It's a total lottery. You just apply to be in the public gallery and it could be any case. It was actually a murder trial. And I must admit, I found it quite fascinating. It's not clear at what point the idea of killing John Lennon came to him, but an Esquire article in mid-October 1980 entitled John Lennon, Where Are You? In Search of the Beetle Who Spent Two Decades Seeking True Love and Cranial Bliss Only to Discover Cows, Daytime Television and Palm Beach Real Estate may have completed the job that Catcher and the Fawcett book started. Mark recalls that his evil child prayed to the devil to, quote, give me the strength to do this, while his phony adult prayed to the angels. Unlike John Lennon, Mark couldn't scream out his pain in records heard by millions. All the confused thoughts in his head seemed to synchronise, spinning in one direction. The phony must die, said the catcher in the rye, was the phrase that popped into his head, or perhaps was put there by um, certain organisations, and he felt the sense of destiny that he'd apparently had all his life. Now Marlon Brando, in this, in his autobiography, a very good book called Songs My Mother Taught Me, and this recent audio book that I've listened to, the idea of phoniness was a big part of his life as well. He figured out pretty early that so much of the world was phony or otherwise known as bullshit, propaganda. I think I figured that out fairly early. John did, Marlon did, don't know if Mark Chapman did. 23rd of October 1980, John Lennon releases Just Like Starting Over, the first single from Double Fantasy. Chapman walked out of his job the same day, signing out as John Lennon. But very interestingly in this book, not only did he sign John Lennon, but he also crossed the name out into angry horizontal lines. On October the 27th, he bought a Charter Arms .38 revolver in Honolulu from a salesman called Ono. Hmm. With no nationwide police check, he got his police permit at the local station and became one of the thousands who bought handguns legally in the USA. He lunched with Diane the next day and on the 29th left for New York, staying at the Waldorf Hotel and eating and sleeping well. He saw The Elephant Man on Broadway, starring David Bowie, and visited the Dakota, chatting to Jose Padermo. I'll direct you back to the previous episode with Gordon Rutchford about Jose Padermo. He was a Cuban revolutionary and ended up as a doorman at the Dakota. Now, if it's true that Chapman did see The Elephant Man, starring Bowie, this goes against what I said in episode two of the podcast, the rather strange last day in the life of John Lennon, about the fact that Chapman had a seat booked for the day after he killed John Lennon and John and Yoko also had seats booked and so all three of them would have been on the front row. That seems a bit fanciful to me. I, I, hard to prove but I don't buy that somehow. So I believe Chapman probably did see the elephant man before the killing. Around this time Reagan won the presidential debate. Was John Lennon mobilised by Reagan's coming victory? His interviews don't suggest it. John and Yoko hadn't taken to the street since May 72 but were now due to go with Sean to San Francisco for a Teamsters rally in support of Japanese-American workers striking for wage equality, one of which was Yoko's cousin. Mark Chapman couldn't get bullets in New York. He had a holiday, as usual, mixing luxury with Y hostels. So you'd stay in a nice hotel, then go to a YMCA hostel, then sometimes go back to the nice hotel. Went back to Atlanta on November the 5th and got hollow point bullets. These are the ones I mentioned in the last show. They shatter on impact. Yeah, horrific. From Dana Reeves, who I mentioned earlier, his sheriff's deputy friend. They went out into the woods to practice with them. Chapman told Dana that he needed protection from muggers in New York, which I speculated was fairly plausible to a southern policeman like Dana. You know, we talked 
in the last show about regional differences, you know. Gordo was kind of of the mind that this Dana Reeves guy should have perhaps been questioned a bit more by the police after the shooting. I think he felt bad about it. I think he was in this documentary that I'm putting a link to. He obviously would have had nightmares about it either way after the shooting. Chapman arrived back in New York on November the 9th, checking into a hotel 200 yards from the Dakota. Dorman there told him John Lennon was out of town. He saw ordinary people at the cinema. That was a Robert Redford film starring Donald Sutherland. Identifying with a troubled adolescent in the film, he called Gloria, his wife, telling her that her love had saved him from doing a terrible thing. He returned again to Hawaii, claiming a great victory, and he threw away his copy of The Catcher in the Rye. The darkness never went away, though. He could come across as charming and caring, but beneath it was a blackness, a void. He went on a Pearl Harbor memorial tour and found it amusing. Now, I've put a note here. Mark Chapman, John Lennon, Marla Brando and myself. Caring for the world, championing the underdog, but with a private hatred of people. I wouldn't say I had a hatred of people. I think that's a bit strong. Just correcting my own notes that I made three weeks ago. <laughs> There's a John Lennon lyric that is often cited from a song called I Don't Want to Face It, which was released posthumously and would have been on his 1981 album had that happened. You say you want to save humanity, but it's people that you just can't stand. The idea there is that people get involved in causes for all kinds of things. There's lots of theories about the fact that people who get involved in causes are often, it's because they have some neurosis or they have some problem in their own life that they can't solve and that solving the world's problems in a way is a substitute and then there's some stuff about chapman controlling his wife because he couldn't control the outside world he called in a fake bomb threat just to see the reaction he would call people to anonymously harass them and harass the phony harry krishnas for weeks chapman was later quoted as saying how can a person function if he doesn't feel and of course there's a john lennon lyric from the song how how can i feel love if i just don't know how to feel another scene switches back to new york Chapman landed back in New York on 6th of December. Now, there's some stuff in Fenton Bresler's book about the flight ticket. I don't remember the specifics, to be perfectly honest, but it's possible that Chapman may have spent some time in Chicago. He did have a grandmother there, but Bresler speculated about whether, again, he might have visited CIA agents. All very speculative, but if you listen to the previous show with Gordon Rochford, I think you'd have to agree that there's plenty there to speculate about if an absence of hard evidence. In New York, he took a cab ride. This is the Bresler book that involved drop-offs and collections and he appeared agitated. The other book, the Jack Jones book, doesn't mention any of that and is very sort of non-conspiratorial. And then a lot of Chapman's actions, as well as mirroring John Lennon, start to mirror Holden Caulfield. He spent one night in the Y having trouble with the gays, just like Holden Caulfield. On the 7th of December, which is the day before the shooting, he read John Lennon's recent Playboy interview over dinner at the Sheraton Hotel. He called a prostitute but didn't have sex with her, just like Holden Caulfield. 8th of December, Mark Chapman laid out a display of treasured possessions, including a pocket Bible inscribed Holden Caulfield, and with Lennon added to the Gospel according to John. His passport, two photos of himself with Vietnamese refugee children, his recommendation letter from the Y director, his Honolulu to Chicago return ticket with the New York portion not on display and a Wizard of Oz picture of Dorothy wiping away the lion's tears. He rehearsed the police walking in to find the display. At that time, quote, the paragraphs and sentences of Catcher were flowing through my brain and entering my blood. He practiced twisting, crouching and aiming the gun which makes me think of Travis Bickle in Taxi Driver. And in fact, I've often thought that Taxi Driver is some sort of propaganda for the lone nut theory. The writer Paul Schrader said it was based on himself, his sense of isolation. But um, I've always thought that was a little bit, I don't know, too much supporting the lone nut theory. But anyway, it's a good film. Now again, a lot of Beatles fans would be aghast if I said that I found this display of possessions quite touching. But there's something about... That Wizard Oz picture of Dorothy wiping away the tears, you know? I consider this a heinous crime and a tragic event on many, many levels. So rather than hating the person himself, I hate the act. Because from having done this research and reading about him, this guy was a victim in many ways. He did one terrible thing. He did some very nice things in his previous life, particularly with these refugee children. And there's a lovely picture actually of him 
one of the pictures of uh, one of the kids on his shoulders. So quoting from the catcher in the rye, the fall, it's a special kind of fall. The man falling isn't permitted to hear himself hit the bottom. He just keeps falling. And the events of catcher in rye happen Saturday to Monday in December in New York, which is, of course, exactly what happened. But rather than thinking of that as destiny, surely Mark Chapman just decided to fly to New York on those days. He later claimed that he suddenly realized that it was happening similarly to Catcher. We don't know whether that was planned or not. Was he looking for synchronicity? He claimed to find 50 coincidences with Catcher, not to mention the John Lennon lyric, people say I'm crazy doing what I'm doing. They give me all kinds of warnings to save me from ruin. This is um, from the song Watching the Wheels, which came out on Double Fancy in 1980. But, you know, there's a hell of a lot of people who could identify with that. It's the whole thing with John Lennon. So many young men identify with his lyrics. It's not just one guy. No longer riding on the merry-go-round. That's from the same song. And that's quite interesting because the last scene of Catcher in the Rye is Holden Caulfield watching his sister go on the merry-go-round in Central Park. If you've ever read Catcher in the Rye, I mean, I was in tears when I read that book. It's such a sad story of a, a lonely young man. And that's why I feel some sympathy with Chapman. I don't feel any sympathy with his act, of course. But, you know, this heinous crime, it was one moment of his life. And um, I consider him a victim in many ways. Anyway, the weather was 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which for the beginning of December is pretty warm. Chapman had bought Double Fancy and he bought a copy of Catcher in the Rye. In his copy of Catcher, he wrote to Holden Caulfield from Holden Caulfield, this is my statement. Chapman was so engrossed in Catcher that he missed John Lennon appearing from a cab and entering the building. This is on the morning of December the 8th. He met Paul Goresh, who will be very significant in this story, who took photos of Paul Simon, Lauren Bacall and Mia Farrow leaving the Dakota. Now, of course, Mia Farrow was the star of the film Rosemary's Baby, which was filmed at the Dakota. I don't know if that was the interior and exterior. Obviously, the exterior, you see them going into the building in the film. Goresh had once posed as a repairman and got into John Lennon's bedroom. There's this fan called Jude. She introduced Mark Chapman to Sean. And Mark David Chapman shook Sean Lennon's hand on the day he was about to take his father away. Why do you have to shake a young boy's hands? I understand you have a compulsion, a warped compulsion to kill his father. But you don't have to rub it in that way. John Lennon came out in the afternoon and then there's this famous thing with the autograph. There is a story that Chapman asked John Lennon for a job, but uh, I'm not sure if that was verified. But anyway, then the, we've got this famous macabre picture of John Lennon and Mark Chapman, and John's got his head down signing the autograph. Just so bizarre to have a picture of the two of them together about five hours before the shooting. Chapman talked a lot to Jose Padermo, who's this doorman who was a Cuban revolutionary. They agreed that Castro had probably been involved in the JFK murder. So interesting that they're talking about conspiracies and this act of Chapman's has been subject to conspiracy theories. Again, not using that as a pejorative, just using that as a neutral term. Chapman, quote, It was a child that killed John Lennon, but it didn't know how to, so I summoned dark forces. It takes a lot of inner strength to do something as hideous as killing a man. The child's anger conspired with the adult's ability to make a plan and get the functional things done. So yeah, the adult is taking care of these practical things like buying air tickets and going to the Dakota, and then this evil child takes over. At the moment of truth, or just after the moment of truth, I should say, the child disappeared, job done, and the adult was left with the grim reality of the event and the consequences. The child had obtained purpose, but the adult's life was effectively over. As John Lennon lay dying, Chapman had hoped to dissolve into the pages of the book, but it never happened. Now, I've never done anything remotely like killing somebody, but... There were times where I, I have dissolved into fantasy and I have kind of hoped to be swallowed up by it. But unfortunately, reality is still there. You know, you can take drugs, you can do all kinds of things to try and escape it. But unfortunately, unless you go into full-blown permanent drug psychosis or oblivion, unfortunately, reality is going to be there waiting for you when the pill wears off, so to speak. So in the aftermath of the ghastly deed... Chapman clung to Steve Spiro, repeatedly saying, don't let them hurt me. Spiro was quoted, of course, as saying that the killer was a local screwball, which, of course, is ridiculous. He wasn't from New York. Chapman had $2,000 in cash in his wallet. 
John Lennon was immediately promoted from an aging rocker to a secular saint. If the outpouring of grief was because he was a peacenik and activist, could his killing also have been political? So in a way, the people made his killing political because they elevated him to something way beyond the musician. He was a significant cultural figure, of course, and he was elevated to a saint. Yoko Ono was in the Dakota while up to 5,000 people congregated and played John Lennon's music all night. Elliot Mintz arrived, then Ringo Starr. Three people committed suicide. The event was marked in the US and Britain, and at the Amsterdam Hilton, all the lights were turned off except in Suite 902. This is where the bed-in had taken place in March 1969. The post-mortem was on the morning of the 9th, that's the morning after the killing, and the next day John Lennon was taken in a black bag from the mortuary to the funeral home and cremated. Inevitably, the smell of money was in the air, and a mortuary worker made a quick $10,000 with a picture of John Lennon on the slab. I did publish a picture of that to accompany a blog post I wrote. I feel a bit bad about that because it's a nasty picture. On the 14th of December, there was a 10-minute silent vigil observed around the world. Chapman's defence was assigned to Herbert Alderberg, but he received a menacing phone call and very soon after dropped out. He did manage to get Chapman remanded for 30 days to see if he was fit to stand trial. Chapman looked blank even when a false criminal record was read out after a file mix-up. So Gordon Rochford mentioned this. This strange behaviour, like Sihan Sihan, of this sort of blankness. So basically they mixed up his records with someone else and started reading out this criminal record that Chapman absolutely didn't have, but he didn't move a muscle, he didn't say anything about it. The replacement defence lawyer, Jonathan Marks, quickly filed a plea of insanity. After four days in maximum security, Chapman was transferred to Rikers Island under heavy security. Now the question is, was that for his own security or to stop him talking, as Oswald had done in police custody? He went on hunger strike, was allowed phone calls. And Bresler says, was he perhaps called with instructions? I've got lots of notes here about psychiatrists trying to assess Chapman's mental state, and he tended to veer between different explanations of why he did it. But sometimes he would emphasize that he was normal and that he'd chosen hollow point bullets especially to do the most damage and to achieve his end they explode on impacts there's thousands of steel particles inside john lennon's skinny body as soon as the first bullet hit so i suppose he was veering a little bit between an irrational child and a more rational adult but one of the crucial things of course that goes against this rather simple theory that he did it to become famous and i always argue that the public like it simple Give them a solution that seems to fit and get them angry if they want to, and they're happy with that. But what goes against that is the fact that he suddenly decided to plead guilty. Apparently a voice from God told him to do that, thus denying himself the trial of the century. And he would have been much more famous than he is now if he'd had that trial. Eight mental health experts gave testimony on his mental state, mostly saying he was narcissistic and paranoid schizophrenic. When he decided to plead guilty... The judge spoke to him directly and his answers suggested that he knew what he was doing. The voice from God that told Chapman to plead guilty was not audible, i.e. he wasn't, quote, hearing voices, and he acted in his own free will. Of course, this is all superficial, but it satisfied the judge. Presler says that he was treated, quote, like a shoplifter changing his plea. Chapman was later reported by Dr. Dorothy Lewis to have been suffering auditory hallucinations. He seemed to realise the implications of his act and his plea and he was tearing his hair out in Rikers Island, shaving his head and smashing up his cell in a, quote, demonic outburst. Everything here is very speculative. I mean, he's not really a reliable witness, let's say, witness to his own actions. In the end, of course, he ended up at Attica Prison. Again, a bizarre parallel with John Lennon in 1971, a four-day riot. Attica prison had killed 37 and inspired the song Attica State. Another parallel was that Attica resembled the Dakota Lennon's quote-unquote prison for five years. Again, if you believe the John Lennon staying in bed depressed for five years theory. Chapman went on hunger strike and retreated to his cell after threatening other prisoners. In 1984, Yoko Ono donated $1 million for a part of Central Park near the Dakota to be built as a garden called Strawberry Fields, including 25,000 strawberry bushes. Since then, she has taken on the role of Keeper of the John Lennon Flame, 
Although she's been accused of playing up one side of John Lennon's life, he has left a genuine legacy of the idea of pop music as a political force, inspiring Bob Geldof, etc., and the idea of, quote, mobilising a growing spectrum of opinion that finds no expression in conventional politics. I would say mainstream politics, but what do we do nowadays? Everyone I see on social media just focuses continuously on Trump. Absolutely no investigation into what might be behind him. Nothing at all. It's fucking pathetic. And it's 2020, for God's sake. John Lennon said, quote, Your way of life is a political statement. The struggle is in the mind. We must bury our own monsters and stop condemning people. We're all Christ and we're all Hitler. What an amazing quote. So I want to get on to a part of my notes that I've called celebrity and identity. And this is very, very important. So of the people I've been talking about today, obviously Lennon and Brando were the celebrities. Chapman became, unfortunately, a celebrity. I'm definitely not a celebrity, although I'm uh, in my own small way. <laughs> For a thousand people who listen to my podcast, does that make me a celebrity? I don't know. But there's some really amazing stuff, so brace yourself for this. Chapman has received thousands of letters from all over the world, running the gamut of tortured human emotion from suicidal and homicidal rage to hero worship and forgiveness. All this section, by the way, is coming from the Jack Jones, Let Me Take You Down book. And of the two, I would recommend that one. It's got some amazing stuff, as you're about to hear. One woman offered to save his soul, while others have shown romantic interest. Now, we know all about Ted Bundy and uh, marriage proposals, and very, very strange. The hate mail is chilling in its depths of loathing, as is, arguably more so, the hero worship and autograph seeking. The Red Cross bizarrely wrote to Chapman asking for donations autographed for a celebrity auction. Some samples of hate mail. You're the worst person ever from the world. Born, nobody cares. Dead, hopefully very soon. If they let you out, someone will kill you soon and I'll die laughing. A French girl who claimed to be in love with Lennon told Chapman politely in broken English that she hoped he'd be murdered when he got out of prison. Another one, I wish you a gruesome death. Others brag that you are unable to live the life I do. You're eating prison slop while I'm going out for hamburgers tonight. I put in my notes, strange choice of food, bragging about their life and reveling in his misery. This is perhaps a controversial thing, but I think when you revel in someone's misery that you've never met, it says something about you. I, I believe for many, many years that in most people, often in the most conventional people, there's a certain anger, there's unmet needs, there's all kinds of psychological issues going on, and they come out in various ways. Another one, you've prevented John and the rest of us from enjoying getting old together. I've put in my notes, why is your happiness dependent on John Lennon, and why do you think you're going to get old with John Lennon? Finally, you're a filthy fucking scumbag and I hope you rot in hell. Fairly succinct. At the other end of the scale, he's received fan mail such as what you did was to remove from our planet a great menace who threatened the stability of our nation. One woman wrote of serving nine years for slashing someone but not having the nerve or the courage to do what Chapman did. A Russian girl who was president of their fan club wanted Chapman to save her from suicide by explaining why he did it. Her home phone was a 24-hour hotline for others feeling like she did. Some wrote of their own identification with Catcher in the Rye. Others were Christians offering forgiveness. Many celebrities received death threats related to the would-be killer finding an identity. A fictional character is unchanging and safe. A substitute for a self threatened with annihilation. Real-life role models can fulfil this, as can alter egos. Stephen King himself, prey to obsessed fans, wrote The Dark Half and Misery both of which I'd recommend, and the film of Misery is amazing, with Kathy Bates and James Kahn. Stephen King, of course, as a side note, was part of one of the conspiracy theories that he killed John Lennon. I consider these kind of theories a very convenient smokescreen for more credible theories. You just put out a ridiculous one, it conforms to the public view, largely, that conspiracy theories are rubbish. It's all very convenient. On the 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination, so that would have been November 2013. Again, proof positive that the mainstream media does not reflect what people really think. The only theory that was posited, other than Lee Harvey Oswald, was some ridiculous thing from an Australian journalist, which was that he'd been killed by someone in the car behind him, or some rubbish like that. So they give you a representation of the non official story, which is something completely ludicrous and yeah there was nothing else said about any kind of cia involvement mafia involvement cuban involvement anyway so in the jack jones book he 
quotes quite a bit from a, a book from 1979 that I haven't read, but I quite like to, called The Culture of Narcissism by Christopher, I think it's Lash, L-A-S-C-H. So there's some amazing quotes from this book. Lash states that a collapsing social and family order has created the new borderline personality, unable to quite distinguish fact from fiction. The elevation of celebrities and the tendency to live vicariously through them produces admiration but also envy and sometimes hate. Stars become a projection screen for a lot of insanity. People take to both political and cultural icons, now almost indistinguishable, to solve their problems. The illusion of fame is now even less about achievement than when the book was written, and literally anyone can now be famous for nothing except perhaps being famous. What I'm reading, by the way, is a kind of a mixture of quotes from the book and my notes on those quotes. <laughs> I can't remember which is which, to be honest. So just, uh, you know, listen to the information, see if it makes any sense to you. Lash wrote his book out of concern for the disintegration of the traditional family and the rise of a me-first code of personal fulfillment that has displaced social consciousness and individual responsibility very good documentary by adam curtis called the century of the self which goes through in uh, i think it's about three hours or more how we went from collectivist to this sort of very narcissistic individual society that we live in the narcissistic family either has parents that aren't physically there or otherwise too self-absorbed and emotionally immature or on the other hand too present and this brings to mind pushy parents using their children to live out their dreams I've seen this again in my own eye. This is absolutely terrible, this thing where the parents don't actually care what the children think. They're just living out their own unfulfilled dreams. You know, the famous bumper sticker thing, you know, my kid's better than your kid. The sort of point scoring against other rival parents. Mental health professionals nowadays see far less of the traditional hysterical neurosis and clearly identifiable madness. So in the past, you were basically either sane or mad, but nowadays we've got this sort of semi-madness that I think infested our society. I think nearly everyone you meet is mad to some extent, <laughs> including me. Uh, I think we're just all on the spectrum nowadays. Now there are a range of more ambiguous character disorders which are products of a new society. Aspects of life such as corporate culture and modern politics, where manipulation of relationships and information bring success, encourage narcissism. I've put in my notes, not to mention the utter fakery involved. I mean, the media politics has really got nothing to do or very little to do with real life. Obviously, you know, the policies are real and the effects on us are real, but the representation of it is just, it's, it's a show, you know. I've recently been watching the show Veep and I watched the thick of it earlier this year, which is sort of the English version, but Veep with Julia Louis-Dreyfus is genius. The thick of it as well, really, but Veep is what I'm watching at the moment, so it's kind of fresh in my mind. You know, good comedy is a slightly exaggerated version of reality. And Jason Barnard, who was on the program for the John Lennon Worst and Best Songs, episodes 33 and 34, he actually works for the Cabinet Office here in England. And he said the thick of it is an exaggerated version of that. And Veep, I mean, Selena Meyer, Julia Louis-Dreyfus' character, is just being fake all the time. I mean, she's being real just behind the scenes when she's talking to her advisors, but she just has to go out there and act just continuously. Anyway, great show. Recommend The Thick of It and Veep. And I've put a note here. The internet has taken this fakery to incredible heights. Many burn out when their superficial looks fade. Often, quote, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, I love that quote, with cosmetic surgery, and all they find left is a void. So, you know, people, if you want to change your life significantly in one move, stop watching the television or stop relying on the television for your view of the world because I'm telling you... It it will encourage you to run away from your problems and it's just going to increase this void. You're going to be left with this emptiness. You've got to start looking inward for solving your own problems. Do you know who you are? Said the policeman to John Lennon, a question that had haunted both John Lennon and Mark David Chapman. And I'm going to add, and Marlon Brando and myself. John Lennon's public sharing of his constant search for identity laid the groundwork for Chapman's obsession. Fred Seaman who I nearly got on my show and uh, who wrote a very entertaining book. I'm not sure how much of it was true, but a lot of it did ring true to me. He was John Lennon's personal assistant from 1979 to 1980 and stayed in Yoko's employment briefly after that. I believe that John Lennon's failed relationship with Julian and its sad mirroring of John's relationship with his own father, Alf, led him into birth, death, obsession and mysticism. Fred Seaman's Uncle Norman, I think it was, had been shot, and John Lennon was fascinated with the details. 
In 1980, Lennon talked about having a rendezvous with something and had recurring dreams about death. Did he have a premonition? He'd said, quote, We're willing to be the world's clowns because all the serious people like Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Gandhi got shot. Another quote of Lennon's from the past was guilt for being rich and that love and peace maybe isn't enough when you have to go and get shot or something. So to quickly address this idea of a premonition, I mean, Yoko hinted at this in the 1988 Imagine film, which is very mainstream, official John Lennon was happy in 1980 version. So it's quite surprising to hear her say that. I mean, he may have had a vague sense and more than one person has said that, but if you think of the actual day itself, I mean, he gave a long interview talking about his life and talking about his plans for going on tour in 1981. Why would he do that if he had some idea that he was going to be killed? He gave his autograph to Chapman. This was featured in the film Chapter 27. I included a little clip of that, the autograph clip at the beginning of the previous episode with Gordon Rochford. And he says, you know, is that all you want? And Chapman says, yes. And he says, are you sure? Is that all you want? That was kind of made up, I think, Perhaps he said, is that all you want once? But this idea that he said it again, I don't think Paul Goresh has corroborated that. And when the shooting occurred, it didn't appear at all that John Lennon saw it coming and he fell like anyone would who'd been shot with hollow point bullets. Sorry to go into the gruesome details again, but I'm just saying to sum up that nothing on the actual day gives any indication that he had a premonition. He behaved anyone else who was going about their normal day, as normal as a day in John Lennon's life can be, and was gunned down. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Did he even desire it? To Fred, John had a lot of abstract knowledge, but no ability to apply it to his own life, making it useless. Again, Brando was a huge reader. I don't know if Chapman was. I'm certainly a huge reader. But I think very often you do find this. You read and read and read, but if you can't apply it to your own life, it just becomes yet another crutch. John Lennon was, quote, a complex man given to extremes of rage and human compassion, a man who crusaded for world peace against a backdrop of inner turmoil. His brutal honesty was something people wished they had, so they lived vicariously through him. Couldn't agree more. Albert Goldman, the much maligned Goldman, who to some Beatles fans is just above Mark David Chapman <laughs> in their estimation. Sudden fame like Lennon's is dangerous and causes self-destructive suicidal behaviour and a yearning for an early grave and martyrdom. The experience of a rock star is like a rocket ascent with a burning tailpipe. When it's gone, the ultimate comeback is death and rebirth. A lot of celebrities tend to focus on Jesus and Hitler, both megalomaniacs. Obsession with death is a part of the myth about themselves. Some of this stuff is amazing. I mean, uh, I hope that you're listening and that you perhaps will listen back and digest it. I'm very much like that as well. When I listen to something I find interesting, I tend to go back and really try and grasp it. Chapman told Dr. Naomi Goldstein that he had the sensitivities of a child and that the four Wizard of Oz characters were all parts of him. He revealed everything to doctors in the hope that they'd tell him who he was. Dr. Goldstein found him elusive, with symptoms of multiple disorders, but lucid and highly sensitive to the suffering of the world, but not John Lennon himself. Again, it's this strange thing where you, well, you appear, or you perhaps delude yourself that you care about humanity as a sort of amorphous whole, but you have problems with individuals, you know? One modern phrase is trustafarian, which is upper middle class kids who uh, support causes don't do anything about things they can actually affect. I guess social justice warriors get tagged with this as well because it's easy to care about people who live all the way over the world that you're never going to meet or you're never going to have to do anything about. I know that sounds very cynical and it doesn't apply to everyone. I want to make that clear. It's just a certain type of person, normally the one that's trying to make other people feel guilty, in fact. Chapman said the forces of good and evil lived independently inside him and he battled them constantly. He was permanently scarred by failure to protect his mother from his abusive father while a child and this led to a lifelong failure to control impulses. Grandiosity is a classic defence against inadequacy and it's hard to know if the visions of a quote special mission are real or not. The John Lennon killing was a search for identity and destruction at the same time. Narcissistic nobody Mark David Chapman was drawn to narcissistic somebody John Lennon and the murder became a replacement suicide. 
Nobody sees stars as not subject to the banalities of everyday life, such as flushing the toilet and clipping their toenails. And their, quote, shit smells sweeter than most. It's this idea, you know, you, you never see... Perhaps nowadays with uh, quote-unquote reality TV, you see celebrities doing the banal things of life, you know. But, uh, yeah, this idea that they're always beautiful, you know. You only ever see them being beautiful. They don't have bad days, or when their life does collapse, it often appears cool and glamorous. The entertainment industry, which now includes politicians, traffics in fantasy. The stars appear to speak to the normal person, and they may well be narcissists themselves, or become as good as, through the industries they're in. John Lennon's cremation and the secret location of his ashes has at least spared in the fate of Elvis, Jim Morrison and James Dean, who in death are still subject to the fantasies of those who visit their graves, or in Elvis's case, threaten to rob them. Less than a hundred yards from the Dakota Archway where the shooting happened, Strawberry Field sits as a subtle oasis of tranquility in one of the most violent cities on earth. They come from all over the world in all weathers, some wanting to kill Mark David Chapman and some realising that he's just another human being and a product of our society. Brackets, he wasn't born a killer and none of his ancestors ever killed, with things going on in his head that are impossible for outsiders to understand. I'm just going to repeat that because that's basically my view, because I never met this guy. Some realising he's just another human being and a product of our society, with things going on in his head that are impossible for outsiders to understand. Perhaps, having done these three shows about him, that's really the telling thing that I would like you to take from this. If you care what I think about it, it's up to you. And if you want to talk about sickness, let's talk about tourism, shall we? Just briefly. Many people come to New York. They go to Strawberry Field in Central Park. Perfectly natural. They're curious about the Dakota. I went to New York once in 2002. I went to the Dakota, had a quick look. But I did see a magazine interview with a Dakota doorman. Not Jose Padermo, by the way. It was about 10 or 15 years ago, I think. And it was quite disturbing, really. The levels of interest slash voyeurism that were involved and this doorman has said you know the amount of people that funnel through wanting to see the exact spot where john lennon fell is quite disturbing obviously you can't get to that spot but he actually talked about people with something of a rabid look in their eyes saying oh really can i see the spot can i see the spot and they have to keep telling them politely no you can't go any further than where you are now and not only that, occasionally they said, and they stressed it was very, very occasionally, a tiny fraction, you would get people who would actually have some sort of strange smile on their face. And there were even a couple of people who wanted to take a picture and do the air guitar thing. So have a think about that. You know, we are still animals. We've been civilized to some extent, but I think you have to be a bit careful when you start talking about sickness in others, you know. Obviously, Mark Davis Chapman's act was much worse than being curious or even rabid in your pursuit of the spot where John Lennon fell. But I think we need to think about that. Human sickness is a very, very interesting topic. And if you look too deeply into it, quite a disturbing one as well. Anyway, end of sermon. John Lennon, whether he had an actual premonition or not, knew that potential danger was out there and didn't want to become a martyr by getting shot, which is exactly what he quickly became. As for CIA involvement, the question remains why they waited until 1980. Now, I did say this to Gordon Rochford in the last episode, and I didn't pull him up on this, but he said they always get them when they're on the way down. But, of course, Robert Kennedy was shot, and Gordo and myself believe that this is very likely that that was a political assassination. Bobby Kennedy was shot just after the California primary and after he'd given his acceptance speech. But anyway, was it to lull John Lennon into a false sense of security since his activist phase was long gone? There appear to be more whys than hows. And again, that would sum up my opinion of the idea of it being a conspiracy. Finally, Mark David Chapman has a recurring dream where he's in his Honolulu apartment with his wife and his copy of Double Fantasy, bought on December the 7th, 1980, and signed John Lennon 1980 on December the 8th. Apparently, uh, John Lennon didn't usually sign with as much detail as that. He actually wrote John Lennon 1980, which is very telling, of course, because it's him essentially signing off, telling us the month that he died, or the last month that he was going to be around. Right up to the last moment, it could have gone one of two ways. That single moment. 
And, you know, how many times in our lives have we had a single moment that defines us? You know, maybe it's not one moment, but, you know, we all make choices. And right up to the last moment before he pulled the trigger, he was wrestling with that. At the end of the day, this is a sad story of victims of various kinds. And uh, there's not much good that can come of it, really, but perhaps just to value your life. You know, it's hard not to lapse into cliches at a time like this, but, you know, to appreciate your freedom, appreciate what you have, you know. I believe we're all damaged mentally. As I said, it's a, it's a spectrum. And I think we're damaged by modern society. The stress levels of just walking down the street and being bombarded by, you know, I don't know what the stat is, but hundreds or even thousands of pieces of advertising every day, whether we like it or not, you know. And that might be, you know, in a, in a city, for example. In the countryside, that's not going to be the case. Perhaps I could leave you with this. I think life is a, really a series of moments and choices and you know there's all kinds of circumstances that go into those choices just as you know on the news media there's a million things that happen behind the scenes that you don't see before the headline the catch-all simple version of it is presented to you with the average debate lasting about i don't know 90 seconds if you're lucky that might be a bit of an exaggeration but um propaganda gordo did a brilliant podcast about it those conspiracy guys look up propaganda it's uh seven hours i think but you know you can do it go for it <laughs> pace yourself as i said in the last episode propaganda is everywhere i mean we've got this coronavirus thing i don't go so far the david ike route if you look at david ike on london real he's got some good insights but as gordo and i said in the last episode you know, he tends to just give a few facts and then just go off on this spiel that is very much well rehearsed because he's in the conspiracy industry, you know, just as mainstream news sources are in the mainstream industry. But um, as I said earlier, I had a blog, and really it just came down to thinking for yourself. So, you know, if you do want to sort of take away from this, it's really just realise that propaganda is everywhere, and it's a huge industry, and there are all kinds of forces that appear benevolent that are trying to shape the way you think. And um, I think this heinous crime was in big part a product of society. I say this guy didn't come out of the womb a killer. No one in his family killed anybody. So not wishing to take the blame away from him because he's got to be responsible for his actions. You know, we, we are heavily influenced by the society around us and by the propaganda industry. So if you've come this far, I want to say thank you very much for listening to me. It's been a cathartic episode for me today doing this. And I hope you've got something out of it. The next episode of the podcast will be with Robert Rosen, who wrote the book Nowhere Man. I'll tell you a bit more about that in the intro to the interview itself. That'll be out fairly soon, within the next week, I'd say. Certainly by the end of April. So it just remains for me to say, on this Sunday the 19th of April, in the sunny suburbs of England, you will have all kinds of people saying to you on the media and in everyday life and correspondence stay safe and of course i want you to stay safe i think you should respect the guidelines but i would also urge you i think if you're the kind of person who has got to the end of this talk you've probably got some kind of alternative mind or capacity for thinking beyond the mainstream so i would say don't be afraid to listen to different opinions about this i've name checked david icke on london real and i've name checked tom secker spyculture.com I don't 100% believe them as much as I don't believe the mainstream either. I think it's just about looking at different sources. But, you know, keep your mind open to possibilities and don't let outrage and hysteria cloud your judgment. You know, we all react, we're all human, and of course it's good to have feelings, but I think there's definitely a place for sober analysis of the facts as well. If you think of the media as a fear operation then that will i think improve your understanding of what media is and what propaganda is it's mostly based on fear i would say the bare facts are correct yes but there are so many things that are difficult to prove as in you know cia involvement in john lennon's murder but there's a hell of a lot of stuff that's already on the record but you never hear about it on the news as i said earlier the idea that mainstream news is reflecting the attitudes of the people in his seeking 
number one, to inform them rather than to make money because it's corporate news is ridiculous to me. So, um, I mean, you know, every day is a great opportunity. And um, if you are feeling sad either because of what's happening at the moment or just in general, you know, there is a way. And um, mostly it's inward. It's turning inward. There's all kinds of very positive media out there. I was knocking self-help earlier, but, you know, it's better than nothing. And there are lots and lots of self-development. I train to be a life coach myself. I'm not pushing my own product here. I don't have a product to push. But um, there's so much free content now. that There are people out there, and it's not the same as being with people, you know. Who knows how long this lockdown. I'm very, very suspicious of all of this. Because, you know, the conspiracy theorists have been saying for 20-odd years that there's an agenda to keep us away from each other. And if you saw that woman on the news a couple of weeks ago saying, please, please stay in, please stay in, as if just staying in is the answer. I know that sounds incredibly callous, and I don't doubt that she was suffering, but it's not against her, it's against the highlighting of that. The way she's just begging people to stay in their houses away from other people, as if that's some kind of magic cure, you know. If you listen to tom secker's podcast about social distancing he's very much calling that into question anyway i don't have the answers i don't think anybody has the answers i'm not a particularly religious person but salvation does lie within and that's probably about the best quote i can come up with to end this so thank you again if you've come this far for listening i'm going to leave you with a couple of easter eggs one of them is a speech made by one of our protagonists i'm sure you'll all be pleased and i'm not giving mdc the last word here it's one of the other ones. And it's from a film made in the late 70s about the Vietnam War. And it is, for me, the ultimate Vietnam War movie. And it's one of my joint favourite films of all time. The director of this film said, My movie is not about Vietnam. My movie is Vietnam. It was a very confusing production. And it's a perfect encapsulation of that ghastly and horrible and disgusting war. As most wars are, but I know particularly about that one because I've studied it a lot, and I'm going to eventually do something on it. But anyway, enough about me. So this is a speech towards the end of the film. The man in question turns up right at the end of the film, really, and steals it, rather like Orson Welles did in the film The Third Man. And then after that is a piece of music that's completely unrelated to today's episode. But there's so much darkness around what we've been talking about today that I thought it was just a bit of light relief. I have huge issues with the BBC particularly in some of their coverage and their unconditional support of Israel. But they do make some great programs, and this is actually the theme tune to a long-running radio show. It's been going nearly 80 years, in fact. Some of you, as soon as you hear this music, will recognise the program. And I'd like to dedicate it to my dear mother, Frances Rotuno, who appeared on my podcast, episode 23 from memory, an episode called The Other 1960s, where she talked about her upbringing in the suburbs of England, the normal 1960s away from the swinging variety. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening, and I'll be back very soon with the Robert Rosen interview, as I said. Take care of yourself, follow the guidelines, as I said, but don't forget to question everything. All right, all the best. I'll see you very soon. Goodbye. It's impossible through words to describe what is necessary to those who do not know what horror means. Horror has a face and you must make a friend of horror. Horror and moral terror are your friends. If they are not, then they are enemies to be feared. They are truly enemies. I remember when I was with special forces, it seems a thousand centuries ago, We went into a camp to inoculate some children. 
we left the camp after we had inoculated the children for polio. And this old man came running after us and he was crying. He couldn't see. We went back there and they had come and hacked off every inoculated arm. There they were in a pile, a pile of little arms. And I remember I cried, I wept like some grandmother. I wanted to tear my teeth out. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I want to remember it. I never want to forget it. I never want to forget. And then I realized, like I was shot with a diamond, a diamond bullet right through my forehead. And I thought, my God, the genius of that. The genius, the will to do that. Perfect, genuine, complete, crystalline, pure. And then I realized that they were stronger than me because they could stand it. These were not monsters. These were men, trained cadres. These men who fought with their hearts, who have families, who have children, who are filled with love. But they had the strength to do that. If I had ten divisions of those men, then our troubles here would be over very quickly. You have to have men who are moral and at the same time who are able to utilize their primordial instincts to kill without feeling, without passion without judgment, without judgment. Because it's judgment that defeats us.